Ladies and gentlemen, 2024 is here, and Terminus, the funeral doom metal of extreme metal podcasts, <laughs> is back. I am, as always, once again, the death metal guy, a.k.a. you shall not permit a sorceress to live. <laughs> and I am the black metal guy, a.k.a. Ildjarn Live. <laughs> would anyone go? I mean, I guess some, like, old guys would go. I feel like Zoomers, like, wouldn't even know who he is anymore, I don't think. No, they all love Iljarn. That's 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 the thing. Like, Iljarn is now more canon. For the average Zoomer, Iljarn's more canon than Dark Throne. It's, like, it's more like, canon, but nobody... No, they're not listening to it, though, are they? Uh, that's That's... The, well, when, um, it, when has that ever been a requirement? When, yeah, when, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> pretending to um, pretending to listen to Iljarn Anonymous. Um, it's uh, the um, yeah. I I feel like um, but yeah, Iljarn live, Burzum live. That would be a tour, right? You yeah. just have Fenris drumming in both bands. <laughs> no, um, just have like the one guy and just like a really bullshit backing band. That, that only have, like, a few practices. Like, make it super disappointing. Like, make the songs, like, fumbling and badly executed. I think that's the best way to do it. I mean, it would be authentic to, like, the old Jarn experience. Wait, wait, you could do him with, uh, you could do it with, um, the, with Vita, with the Iljarn guy and with, um, Ison. But Ison has, ha- Ison has to drink 20 beers before each show. <laughs> And he just, like, he doesn't, the only prep he gets is, like, getting to listen to a, a mixtape of the set list right before he goes on stage. That sounds great, actually. Like, that sounds unironically good. I want to hear that. He's um, just going to kind of, like, fumble his way through you, it. As you best feel as it can. out. Yeah, you feel it out. It's a vibe. Yeah, um, yeah. It's like, it's like jazz, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like, um, it's like a poetry for the forest. Yeah, exactly. Man, that, that'd be a great title. A Poetry yeah. for the Forest. Anyway. Or on the Whispering Wind. <laughs> we're, Conceived we're, in Strength and Anger. <laughs> we're back, boys. Uh, been a, a long winter break since our uh, 2023 blowout, but here we are with 2024. Um, we are both, uh, I, I don't know if I'd say fully recharged, but ready to talk about records again because it's been too long. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, that's, I, I was about to say, it was like, was it really restful? Not fucking really. I'm, I'm even busier than before, but I haven't talked about metal in a while, so we need to, we need to fix yeah. that. Um, so we're going to get into it with a, a couple records released in uh, late 2023 as a little sort of, uh, you know, a, a couple heavily discussed records in our fan base that we're going to cover before we get into the new material of 2024 and uh we're going to get into it without too much preamble but first if you're just joining us this year welcome and follow us on social media follow me the death metal guy on facebook at terminus podcast or the black metal guy on instagram at terminus extreme metal and for those particularly dedicated, before we're able to get Super Chats, when we're actually able to monetize the YouTube channel, which is, I think, only 30 subscribers away, and we'll, have, yeah. uh, we'll be able to start promoting Raid Shadow Legends and Manscaped on every episode. Yeah. Um, if you're particularly enthusiastic about our craft, feel free to subscribe to us on Patreon. For $3 and up gets you access to the Terminus Prime bonus episodes, and $5 and up gets you access to the Terminus Black Circle where you can hang out with us and all of our friends and say, plaintively, Gorgoroth. Gorgoroth. Hey all this is Brandon from Cromlech, and you're listening to Terminus. Ladies and gentlemen, our first review of the year a record that came out in the waning days of 2023 and was uh, discussed a lot both by uh, fans of the show as well as the sort of uh, internet underground black metal community at large. It is the debut record by Flaming Ouroboros titled Anthems for Brotherhood out on, appropriately, Death Hymns. Um, So this is... 
I, I don't know. Where where is this positioned in in terms of uh Zoomer black metal culture? Is this uh, is this a big IG thing? You you would know that better. Oh, right? it's all over Instagram, man. And people are saying it's like album of the year and shit like that. Yeah. 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 So um so here's the um here uh, here's Flaming Aerobros plays a strain of um, modern melodic black metal type stuff that is heavily influenced by punk and emo and uh, metalcore, which is exactly the sort of thing that I typically love, and I hate this, and... This is a cool album to justify the concept of outlaw rock as a genre because this is certainly an outlaw rock album and it is very bad. That's a good point. It's like, you know, you to identify a genre, it can't just be things that you like. Yes. You have to be able to find bad examples of it. Mm-hmm. This it, is This is this is yeah. terrible outlaw rock. Yes. This is fucking terrible. Um, and I am I am shocked by how enthusiastic the reception to this is, and I'm sure that we will angrily get into it later. But suffice it to say, there there's plenty of things wrong with this, and we'll get into abstract territory later in the review. But up front, it's bad music that is um, structurally incoherent, and nearly purely gestural in its songwriting decisions. Um, Anthems for Brotherhood is a record that is so concerned with um, proving its own aesthetic or like justifying itself in various ways that it forgets to provide songs that matter. Uh, It is... And more to the point, I would say the the nutshell version of this is this is simply a bad emo album. And I guess even in the year of our Lord 2024, there's guys who like black metal who still feel some sort of vague insecurity from the fact that they like emo or metalcore or whatever kind of, you know, non-metal music you might be into. But I promise you guys, it's okay to just listen to a good emo album. One that isn't filled with pointless, screechy vocals and blast beats and interrupting Dark Throne riffs that are only there to uh, presume upon the record some veneer of toughness that does not actually exist. You can simply listen to your sad, pretty, wistful music, and you don't have to put yourself through this shit. Like you can just you can just listen to American football, man. The records are at the record store right now. You can just do that. Yeah, this is the um, this is the di- this isn't like the grand foundation of anything new. This is the the sort of the sad logical conclusion of a dying trend, right? This is the end of the sort of game of telephone as black metal has become fruitier and fruitier and fruitier, right? It started with the Finns, you know, people getting into the Finns, and the Finnish sense of melody was really something that had always been in black metal to a degree. You can find similar kinds of mel- like consonant, you know, epic consonant riffs on an Emperor song, or on a Gor- certainly on Gorgoroth, or a lot of the Norse. Um, the Finns just really drew that out. Right and sort of developed a formula for doing it, and that took people back to the French, and then they started getting more and more. You know, you get into your Senior Valans, and then you get into your. Uh, you have DSBM and then, in and the then wings, of course. DSBM's hiding in the wings as everyone's sort of like girl they can't take home to mother. Um, and uh, you, you have your DSBMs, your Miglas, who synthesize you know these tendencies. And, and people start getting into, from all this, you then get bands like Vothana, Grazug, Ordensburg, um, the stuff that gets, um, and, and stuff gets increasingly influenced more and more by just like Absurd and Goat Moon and stuff like that. And you start to get from this kind of stern, uh, sort of stern and resolute melodies that you would get from the Finnish or the kind of, um, uh, you know, the sort of 
yeah, the, the stern nobility of this black metal melody. You start to get things that have more like patriotic euphoria or sentimental yearning or whatever, these sort of brighter major key moods. And there's a way of justifying some of that. Some of it's good and not my thing. Some of it's good and my thing. A lot of it's bad, but hey, it, it sort of makes some sense. Um, and people get, so people get more and more into the most sort of florid aspect of the NSBM sound, right? Mm -hmm. And now finally, uh, you get the stuff that you call friendly cat with, um, uh, fucking, um, you know, Total Vernictung or, uh, you know, Roster Chester or, I mean, what's the worst one? Eisenwinter. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and this band is like the American answer to those three in particular, um, Eisenwinter and Total Vernichten definitely deliberately draw an emo. Um, yes, very. It's so. Flaming Ouroboros cures that as far as you can possibly go. This is I like what you, it's basically an emo record that is sort of deformed and interrupted by black metal structures and black metal. Uh, I hate, hesitate to say riffs. We'll say black metal ideas in the in the riffing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's um, one of the things that goes wrong here is that uh, um, this is when we say emo, we're not talking about screamo or post hardcore or anything with some grit to it. We're talking just like fucking emo songs. Um, and something with those is that they have um, the sort of that sort of bright and subtly textured chording that you might have in some of them is designed to go under a real or implied vocal melody. Mm-hmm. Right, the vocalist is right. You have rock song structures, and there's a, a an out front vocal or maybe lead hook, um, and and maybe the vocalist is singing. Maybe he's more screaming, and it sounds like a melody because you hear the chord progression under him. Mm-hmm. But like, it's um, there's a uh, a sort of natural expressive first person quality to it. It's. And it is, you know, as I say, uh, emotive. Um, and the um, and, and, and the riffs are sort of at the service of that, right? They're more like rhythm parts. Here you have kinds of ideas that you would get in the rhythm parts of emo songs are presented as if they are self-standing, independent black metal riffs that can hold their own weight in relation to screaming vocals. Yes, there's, there's a deep confusion yeah. Um, where where uh, th- this guy seems to think that emo and black metal are just in- collections of interchangeable parts. Um, yeah. Rather than like distinctly different styles of music, which rely on very different organizing principles for their yes. songwriting. And as a result, it's like, I swear to God, it's like King of the Hill. You didn't make black metal better. You just made emo worse. Yeah. You end up with, like, movements of riff to riff that sound where there's no, like, shocking dissonance or interesting harmony. They just sound wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's because he's making these kind of jarring transitions from one cheery uh, major key melody to another. But doing it... um, kind of with a disregard for that organic sense of how a emo rock song would progress, right? There's not like a sense of... You have the thing where in black metal riffing where you've got chords liberated from chording, right? Chords carrying the melody. Mm -hmm. But in this case, they're just sort of um, bumping into each other. uh, And they have none of the... uh, yeah, yeah, they've been divorced from the song structures where they would make sense. Yeah, it's uh, the... I, I, I can't... This really is like... In, there's something about this record where it, it's such an inevitability that this would happen. You know, yes. as someone that really likes black metal and also really likes emo and likes a lot of the modern combinations of those things... I, I can acknowledge that it was always a, a, a dangerous place to walk. And it's it, it's kind of amazing that we haven't seen a catastrophic failure like this sooner. But 
It, I would argue that Eisenwinter... Well, Eisenwinter aspires to less. That's the thing. Eisenwinter, Eisenwinter is, is a meme. It's Eisenwinter deliberately is a meme. like basically a joke band. And right. it's just this kind guy of is, fun. Right. Know? This is intended to be very serious. It hits you over the head with how serious it's supposed to be um, on every aspect of the imagery uh, and the song titles and the lyrics. Um, it insists on its own importance, even in the way the songs are structured. And... Uh, Boy, does it fucking strike out! Oh yeah, the the the, the goofiness of this, like th- there is something hilarious about this in in how just like intensely up its own ass this fucking record, <laughs> the, the the sheer the the sheer concentrated. It, 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 it is the product. The up its own assness is it's a very like you know, and the, the, it's a sincere up its own assness, which makes it almost worse. Um, and it's the product of kind of um, a conversation, black metal becoming so in- immersed, so mediated by internet conversations. Yes. Um, and this sort of chain reaction of what is cool that you lose any sight of the main thread. Oh, it's and this is deep, something I want to say. It's deeply unnatural. It is born completely out of like... DMs on IG. It's it's taking someone else's memes I memes seriously. Yeah. Right? Uh, like like you're not in on the joke. Um. Like the um. And so the the um. What happens? There's like something you said up front about that sort of is a common thread in both of these bands that we're covering tonight is they reach into the past of black metal, but they don't quite know why. Right. Yeah. Um, and there are some parts on this. Um, well, now that we're talking about it, maybe let's go to my sample. Sure. Um, my first one, let's go to ignited supremacy. So there's the interesting thing is that um, despite how immersed this is in like the most ephemeral nowadays, black metal trends, Um, there's stuff in it that also sounds weirdly old, but not in a way that, not in a good way. So let's listen to Ignited Supremacy. It's not just Supremacy. It's on fire. Yeah, it's Um, really, really radical Supremacy. It's, yeah, the Supremist, you might say. (laughs) Everyone tells me. Um, and, uh, this, so, like... We start off with like a classic kind of mid-tempo steamroller riff. This was the first thing on the record. I thought like, hey, this could, okay, maybe we're going somewhere now. Maybe I could get into this. A place they Take your day. Get your breath. Nothing that will be the same. A home that lasts. To live the dream.
hey, it sucks. Yeah, man. Uh, interrupting Dark Throat Riff go. Wow. Um, there's there's no uh, the emo part there. There's no purpose to it. It it's just there to fulfill the obligation the album has to itself. Yeah, so let's think through the song structure here. So we got the steamroller riff. Okay, that's kind of cool. You know, it's got some little ornamentation on it too. That okay, that's that's all right. That's it's bright and major key, but in a kind of like it's got some of the solar energy that this guy's clearly going for. All right, and then we just get this. To- he raises the root or something, and we get this totally listless. Uh, sort of half needling half step riff that I think is supposed to sound more like Norwegian or something. Well yeah, because that's what they did. Yeah. They did the they did the yeah. half step. And that's what they makes it the, black metal. Yeah, and it's it's like the most sort of um uh as de- as we were listening, Death Metal Guy was just like, what is that? Which is the best question. It's the most sort of frail and listless half uh, half gesture. It's not even a gesture. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it sort of immediately saps the previous riff of its energy, um, all purely to signal that maybe this is a black metal record. And then we're in suddenly this da 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 this sort of, um, the classic interrupting dark throne riff, this sort of stomping dissonant second wave thing that... Reminds everyone of In the Shadow of the Horns, but it's really, I try to think, what is that riff? It's not Dark Throne, although Dark Throne probably use it in their later stuff. Mm-hmm. It's literally a fucking Venom riff. <laughs> it's the riff on the Countess Bathory by Venom, which mm-hmm. dissection modifies their Bathory song. And versions of it are all over the 90s stuff. But this is just like... And then it struck me as we go back into the, the d- double double bass steamroller thing, da 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 da. As we go from the, the the venom riff to that, I'm like, shit. Under all this sort of like shiny emo riffing, this is a shitty black and roll record. <laughs> um, this is this is like this is structured the the way that this has quote black metal structures. I'm sure he thinks this is structured like absurd. Uh uh-uh. uh. This is like late Dark Throne or Satyricon black crow on a tombstone and that's a far better song um, <laughs> this is uh at least it works um this is uh so there's this kind of um and this is what i want to get back to with the, sort of um where this sits in in the history of the genre right uh it's it, the record is filled with these sort of real black metal gestures designed to make us think it's not pop. It's right? it's trying to convince it, it's trying to convince a it's trying to convince the listener, yeah, but the only person who would be fooled by it is like under twenty years old. Yeah, and somebody and, who doesn't listen to black metal. Yeah, and like somebody that doesn't listen to black metal, and it's also like trying to convince itself. Which like bothers me more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like the, an, an insecurity seethes off this fucking record. You know, if it was purely just sort of like emo black stuff, it would it would probably be not that much better, but it'd be oddly more respectable in it how it commits to the bit. Yes, it would be more committed to the bit, and it wouldn't be interfering with itself as much. Yes, um, yeah. this is uh, yeah. So what's weird is that. Um, it makes these gestures to the past of the genre, but they're really shallow. And it's like the only influences on this record actually are the most contemporary now, trendy nowadays shit, and this cookie cutter notion of uh, first and second wave black metal, true BM, yeah, which Wikipedia is basically like black metal. Wikip- yeah, fucking Venom and Bathory and and Dark Throne, and not like you know, not the cool parts of any of them. Um, and there's nothing connecting those two things. There's just like fruity insta black and and this sort of uh, carbon copy '90s schlock. And so this is a band that covers itself in the uh, imagery, symbols, paraphernalia. Uh, sort of um, slogans of radical traditionalism, right? Mm. Um, and for all that, Flaming Ouroboros is like 
totally oblivious to the relevant musical traditions. Yeah. <laughs> this this doesn't see this record does not s- situate itself in black metal as a cultural tradition. All of the sort of um all of the sort of the stuff in between the 80s and the 90s and now is kind of missing here. I'm sure he listens to Druk or whatever, but like it's really not if you want sort of like subtle shades of emotion, uh, motion from movement from sort of a minor to major key, sort of a, a heroic brightness, exuberance, um, a sort of like a strong cheer, you get all that in 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 the Slavic stuff, right? In in Drudg and Astrophase. And you also get it, especially in the Germans, right? Nagelfar or um, uh, Odal. Um, and the way those guys work with major key stuff or with more sort of yearning sentimental ideas would all like be helpful here and it's totally absent yeah well I mean because it's not it's not cool that's yeah. that's that's really what it comes down to those ideas aren't incorporated because they're not cool because they are they're dorky in a traditionally black mm. metal way you know, the Dungeons and Dragons is still intact there. And that's the thing that Flaming Ouroboros can't be a part of is like the a, a kind of nerd shit it won't allow itself to intersect with, you know, which is self undermining because what this the idea of cool here is all so much weaker yes. than any of those bands. So let, let me get to a sample. Um here, the, I want to go to Free again, the second track on the album, which is, for for what I am able to determine, the best track on the album. And you'll be, I, let's listen to the first couple minutes of it. And I, after it's played through, it'll be very immediately apparent why it's the best track, but I'll, I, I'll spoil it for everyone after it's done. song yeah. yeah i i think that like so so to spoil it for everyone if you ain't weren't able to figure it out it's the best song because it's all just emo and alt rock it, it has no pretension to black metal there is a blast beat but i mean it it might as well not be there i mean you the could pu- the punk beats are also in emo yeah yeah i mean it, it, like all of this could be directly from like emo and alt rock from like the late 90s into the or even the mid 90s into the early 2000s i mean there's shit on this record that sounds like the promise ring or something and i like the promise ring i think that's fine and i think that's totally fine if you just if if the record all sounded like this 
I wouldn't say it was interesting or I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but I'd probably listen to it again because I've got a spot in, you know, my musical brain just for shit like this. I like those kinds of melodies. I like this sort of emo y alt rock style a lot. But it goes to show that sort of the worst aspect of this record is attempting to be black metal. That's like its its single largest failure is the most metallic stuff on the record. When Flaming Ouroboros is just doing like, you know, bargain bin alt rock shit from 97, it's pretty listenable. It all goes to shit when he tries to make it aggressive. Because there just is, there inherently is no aggression. There is no force behind this music. No, and that's something we'll come back to. It is, um, it presents itself. The other sort of crime here is that he presents the music as if it is that. Yeah, right. which it is. It, it unequivocally is not. I do not know right. how anyone can be tricked into thinking that this has like some sort of like a, a ideological or like even just like physical weight behind it all this stuff is so airy and weightless and I'd, I'd like to say that really the most damning thing that I can say is that the best song on this album this one is basically an adequate Roster Chester song not even one of their better ones yeah. I listen to Roster Chester semi-regularly and you know why I listen to it it's when I want something like kind of abrasive but still with pretty emo melodies and I can play it on Spotify in my car that's why I listen to Roster Chester so, it's not because I have a specific craving for it. It's just that I have a vague mood and Roster Chester can fill it. And that's the best that Flaming Ouroboros arrives at on this record. Yeah, this is so around... Um, you, what you said about the lack of force, we may as well get into some of it, some of the more abstract stuff now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the... Uh, um, there's a funny part that really drives that home right around uh, 640 um, where the chords get a little more pensive, like and then the the lead doubles it just for one rep. It just goes it's the most saccharine like rom-com soundtrack horse shit. Mm -hmm. It just it's the most like sort of sign and resigned riff, uh, like or lick, um, and all yeah, it, it would does be like, is to it'd read. be like a joke thing. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all it's doing is kind of like um, underlining the feeling that's already in the chords, but just like it's, um, it, you know, uh, it's it's like a pathetic sign riff. Um, not sign in like a cool fainting vampire way. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. Just um, and um, and what that riff really conveys is sort of like release in, and not in a sort of ecstatic, uh, culminating way, but in a sort of just like exhalation. Yeah. Um, just uh, and uh, the and so like this. This record sort of, um, in, in the sort of the sun imagery and a lot of the titles, uh, it, it's sort of pursuing a line of, uh, it, it's heavily referencing an ideological current that people call radical traditionalism, right? That you could see starting with Nietzsche, really, but for, for this band, more relevant would probably be Evola and Mishima and all that. Um, but, you know, Nietzsche has his ideas of sort of... Uh, you know, um, Apolline cheer, uh, and, you know, Evola and Mishima both emphasize a sort of solar masculinity, right? Yeah. They, I'm, uh, I'm actually, I'm actually reading Sun and Steel right now. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the thing that everyone it's, forgets about Sun and Steel is that it's like about lifting, which is something that most of the people into this rad trad stuff would never consider doing. <laughs> Right, right. So here, so one thing that you can find both in Nietzsche and Evola is an emphasis on, supreme tension of the spirit as the condition proper to forceful action, right? That, you know, you are, um, that your, uh, your body and spirit is a system under pressure because of an internal hierarchy, right? And because uh, different drives are sort of grinding against one another um, in action. Um, there's none of that here. There's mm -hmm. not a... Um, 
there, this record isn't even chilled out, right? Because that can be its own kind of intensity or anti-intensity, not like tension per se, but there can be like a depth of mood to being so chilled out. What this is, is like homeostasis. This is chirpy, mundane, well-adjusted, right? This is, you're driving to Starbucks and you're gonna talk to the girl with the lip piercing and you feel pretty good about it because the SSRIs are finally working. <laughs> um, and the, the music is, the music is easy, right? It comes easy, it feels easy, it allows you to be at ease. Um, and this isn't the ease of command, right? You know, there's a strength that makes tremendous things seem easy, right? Spite Extreme Wing is a great example mm -hmm. of that. Or like listening to Infernus run through, go through a scale run, yeah. right? It's just like, you know, th there's something astonishing about the ease Yeah, the, yeah mastery. You know? Mastery, right. Um, right, and or ap or Appaline Cheer, right, which is, for Nietzsche, is rung at great cost from awareness of turmoil, terror, uh, conflict and loss, right, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and which is imposed on the world with force, right. He's got a great bit about the uh, Spartan culture as a, a military en encampment of the Appaline, um, but this is there. There's none of that here. There's no uh, people always call this music triumphant, but there's no triumph because no force has been exerted and nothing has been overcome. All this is is like easy contentment, unearned satisfaction. Yeah, there's uh, th this this record trades in the 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 God, not even like the imagery of struggle. There, it's like it's the 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 incredibly vague lyrics don't even talk about like undergoing turmoil. They they talk about like the the possible emotional ramifications of undergoing turmoil. This is, this is I mean this is girl brand. As their banner <laughs> as their banner sway is something like, My brothers of son, we have won. When there are no more justifications, we have won. So you start, you've already won. What wow, what that's... have you won, Flaming Aurobros? Would you like well, to talk about that? Yeah, and, and it's also just like I mean, there's you could take a line like that and give it a meaning, right? in in a sort of uh in a worked out sort of in more worked out lyrics or imagery maybe i would see what you meant by that but in this context it's the first track on the record and it's just like hey we've won great awesome yeah but um, moreover this this the lyrics on this record and this record as a whole is is diligently avoiding specificity yes for a very deliberate reason should i just should i just break out my accusation let Let's go there later because we should get through some more of the. I think that'll come at Rise because when we oh, yeah, Rise, sure. we can get back to that. We'll okay. go back to the lyrics. The lyrics suck too, um, and are very important to the record, so we have to talk about them. Um, but uh, yeah, let, let's go to the next sample. I, I guess actually you were going to sample. No, no, Free Again is track. Yeah, I Which already did that. You already G did that one. GTWE okay. for you. GTWE, my God. Um, so, <laughs> um. This is uh, the longest track on, I made, or one of the longer tracks on the record. Um, it has some parts that sound like black metal riffs, not not like great ones, but just like sort of DSBM or sort of frank, like more sentimental finished stuff. Um, some of them are fine. Um, it sort of faints that it's going in a darker direction and then brings us back to the uh, sort of reassuring and familiar. Um, <laughs> And uh, this is at uh, this is around uh, just before thirty three thirty, um, and this is leading up to one of those moments on the record that made me just go, "God damn, this sucks."
So something that strikes me listening to this, as well as something that I was talking about with you while uh, while uh, Free Again was playing, is that there's a lot of little moments on this that appear to be taken from the, like, emotional parts of Tough Guy Metalcore from the 2000s. Like, on both of these tracks, there's something that sounds like something off the first Immure record. Like, in the, the rare, like, little melodic moments that they use just as, like, contrasting bridges between big breakdown sections. I might be about to kill you with a solar flare, but I'm a man of feeling. It, it, exactly. Well, no, it's it, it's sort of like the logic of, like, the, uh, you know, the the really hardline gangster rap record that has one song about chilling with your lady. You right, know. Shout out to God and my family. Yeah, exactly. It's like DMX having the God song at the end of the record. The, <laughs> the, 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 contrast bo- the contrast reifies the intensity of what came before it and also suggests its own legitimacy. And, right. you know, and that's, that's what the, the tough guy metalcore bands would do, except the tough guy metalcore bands fucking ruled. And this is bad. <laughs> well, this is all the contrast part. This is just all I am a man of feeling. Um, and uh, the you know what's re- you know what's re- you know what black metal guy you know what's really tough as a man you know what real strength is to cry. That's that's so true, man. I never my ther- really my therapist that told me that, and ever since then, I felt way stronger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, it's, it's fuck. <laughs> it's it's um the. So the real egregious part there was just when when that last sort of part comes in, that sort of like groovy little syncopated chorus he does. Mm -hmm. When I first heard it, I thought it was gang vocals, and it's not, but it it could be a gang vocal part. And Mm -hmm. it just sounds so um, chirpy. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's a purely emo gesture. Um, it, It is... I mean, I think there's, there's nothing else to say. Like, if I think, think there's a Foo like, Fighters chord you, phrase tucked away in there too. By the way, I, I wish. <laughs> um, you know, like on Everlong has more to do with black metal than this. Um, the it's just, um, yeah, it's it's. You know, there's another comparison here. If you want to hear someone using kind of similar, right? These sort of spindly riffs are mm-hmm. the closest he gets like post-hardcore stuff. If you want to hear someone using similar melodic ideas in a way that is actually relevant to black metal or to outlaw rock, right? The first Strix Eskesis record has parts that have yes. this kind of like... Um, Strix Eskesis uh, is just one- the categorically good version of this. Yeah, well, we've got a, there are a few categorically ver- good versions of this. So you've got another compare. There's a, now I'll segue to your next one. Um, mm. Or yeah. uh, l- l- remember, so the first Flaming Ouroboros EP came out, and I thought, I'll pull the Majesty, and I listened to it, and I was like, well, this is. I can't say where this project is going yet, right? When I first heard it, I was like, well, this could be terrible, but maybe there's something here. Um, and what you could hear there that you really can't hear as much here is really good guitar playing. Mm-hmm. There was sort of like sophisticated chords that sounded like real shoegaze, like yeah. My Bloody Valentine kind of chordings. Everyone always thinks it's about the pedal tones, but it's about the chords. Um, and, and I almost thought when I heard it like, hmm, this certainly isn't black metal, but it's a bit, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's got some real shoegazy guitar playing and some kind of clattering you know, clattering, blasting stuff, some dramatic changes. Uh, maybe this is more like, you know, what Death Heaven should have been. Mm-hmm. But, uh... But Death Heaven is better than this. Death, Death Heaven, Heaven is, is better, better, than, better this. than this. And I'm gonna fucking die on the hill. I, I, I My hand to God. I'm. This is this is a credible threat. Anyone who loves Flaming Ouroboros, if I see you say that, I'm going to go through your entire internet history. And if at any point in the past I have found you uh, talking shit about Dev Heaven, I'm going to, like, find you and beat you to death in a Walmart parking lot. You're full of shit. Like, there's there's no goddamn way you can say that they were a problem and this is good. 
You you can't fucking do it because Death Heaven at least accomplishes what they set out to do. Death Heaven were a a modern cleaned up screamo band that sort of accidentally got caught up in the black metal scene. Like I don't blame them. Well, for that, no, they they know. knew what they were doing. They they were fucking culture vultures. I mean, they, uh, they culture- totally positioned themselves in. But, you know, being a culture vulture is better than this. Okay, there are culture vultures, but also at the same time, there was already shit that sounded like Death Heaven. Like, like there was there was already stuff. I mean, we've talked about Japanese screamo. There's, like, a ton of stuff that already sounds like black metal there. No, they, no, no. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I agree with that. Musically. More, but, you go ahead. Yeah, musically, they were just a screamo band. They played on the fact that for a lot of people, a lot of people didn't realize blast beat screamo or black metal influenced screamo already had existed for a long time. And they, um, and you know, you like, uh, there are times when I won't blame the bands, I'll blame the PR people and the journalists, but like the bands all have a hand in this. And nobody, if you just said, we are not a black metal band, please don't refer to us that way, nobody would have done that, right? It, they they totally benefited from the black metal thing. The guy gave himself the fucking you know, uh, um, the you know the stormtrooper haircut, and he did his sort of like um, his sort of uh, Morrissey youth rally kind of vibe. They were okay. definitely capitalizing on black metal edge. That, that's fair, um, but I would also say like if you're if you're a guy who's in a screamo band that hasn't gone anywhere yet, and all of a sudden a bunch of metalheads confuse you for something, and it allows you to play really big shows, yeah, I'd fucking do it too. You know, yeah, so no, like, I, yeah, I, I I just I'm like yes, wretch. You know what constantly happens, man? It's like everything that's happened since Wolves of the Throne Room makes me feel a lot more fond of Wolves of the Throne Room. <laughs> makes me think better of them. I'm like, you know, you, you know, like God, Wolves in the Throne Room for all for for all the ways they deviated from the path. They actually understood it a bit better than most of the people who followed yeah. them. And you could say the same thing about Death Heaven. Now that you've heard shit like this, we like Death Heaven never presented themselves certainly as an, a true black metal band, an underground black metal band, as radical militant culture, as like. Uh, you know, as challenging the uh, challenging the world, Death Heaven presented themselves as a black metal influenced screamo band with a little bit of that was like a bit spicy because it was like black metal y. And they weren't really lying about that. Um, and where we were going with this is they wrote, you know, their songs were shallow and didn't have anything to do with shoegaze or black metal, but. They wrote coherent songs. Yeah, they they wrote things that functioned within the idiom. I I was actually, I was, I specifically did this. I listened to Sunbather the other day after listening to Flaming Aurobros just to like spot check it. And it's unequivocally a much better record. Um, But now let's listen. Let's listen to what I I bet is like. The other thing is there are moments of death heaven that are high intensity. The whole point. They have that screamo thing where it gets, even if the chords are kind of like, blissed out and bland they get this kind of grindy feverish energy to them and the yeah, vocals are loud intense. at least yeah. Yeah. they're loud they're they're loud they're fast they go the boom, 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 boom. um yeah <laughs> okay but le- but now let's listen to what i think is supposed to be the centerpiece of this record let's let's listen to rise we've been threatening it let's so let's let's do it let's let, let's listen to rise it's got a it's got a fucking exclamation point doesn't it doesn't it have an exclamation point it should it should because that means in it's our loud. hearts it's the end of side a on the vinyl so you know it's a big deal so let's come on guys let's fucking rise
know, it's so telling that even the gang vocals there sound like just someone kind of talking loudly. It's it's not even like a, a shout or like a bellow or anything. It's just kind of like rise. Like like you like like you know like seventh graders playing the penis game in their their science class or something you know still afraid that the teacher is gonna hear them you know what did they you know you didn't want to bother your neighbors when you were recording or something you can deliver too much intensity um, the shit sucks Deaf Heaven is like categorically better because they at least know how to string a song together this is this is. God, this is so emblematic of Vothanacore, of like the totally unearned significance or so-called significance of its chorus. Like like all the, the simpering sub-emo shit that came before is what generates the momentum necessary for the big gang-shouted chorus, and they can't even muster up the enthusiasm to make that sound compelling. Like, like nobody gives a fuck. Like, like... I, like, Flaming Arobros is somehow, through all of this shit, like, afraid of alienating anyone. You know? Like, like it. I don't know. Who is this for? Like, who is this record for? Sincerely. Is it just, like, guys on Instagram who listen to black metal and say shit like, yeah, I know I shouldn't play video games because it's degenerate, but they're really fun. Like, what what, what are we doing? What what are all these cultural trappings? What What is this bizarre game of telephone with sort of like radical political ideologies and stuff? I know exactly what that is. It's because Flaming Arobros wants to play with the imagery of NSBM bands, but play this game of, ooh, I'm not really touching you, so RABM people will still buy the records. That That's what all this shit is. Flaming Arobros doesn't have anything to say because there's nothing actually behind this. Because this is nothing but aesthetics. You can pin this guy down as to, like, concretely what he believes in. And you can see that in the lyrics, and you can see that in the incoherent imagery, and you can see that in the songs themselves. There isn't anything to say. It is a combination of textures and aesthetics. And that's all it is. Yeah, there's an obsession with the, um, you know, like, it's weird. Like, if I looked at the imagery of this record, it's like pulled into, it's sort of, what to say? I mean, it's like there, there's a couple things going on. If I look at all the imagery, right, you got your fucking inverted algas, you got your, I know it's Al has, but I need the people to understand what I'm saying. Um... Uh, you've got your glorious sun exploding. You've got your um, knights. Um, you've got your ravens. Why are they here? Those are Odinic birds, but never mind. They're fucking grim, I guess. Least grim record ever. Um, you've got your uh, your triangle. I don't know what that one is, um, it, but it looks like a thing. Um, you got swords. Uh, it, it's and you've got your Ouroboros, right? So. Um, and the uh, in, in terms of a lot of the reference points, like a lot of it philosophically points at radical traditionalism, which is like the stuff that was on Heathen Harvest back in the day, right? And that now is more popular on the internet. Um, and it was always sort of like in more in the neo folk scene than black metal, but it sort of converged with it again. And really, NS was sort of just like the dumbed down offshoot of that philosophical tradition. Um, but this guy sort of covers his stuff in this sort of more sort of lofty esoteric right wing imagery um, that uh, that has more to do with the core of black metal um, and at the same time he's so invested in the, like the the skinhead boot boy aesthetic and the contemporary the glamour of contemporary RA, of sorry NSBM uh, and that he's uh, that that the lyrics become kind of this like just weird pale imitation of propaganda lyrics. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, Nobody, because it, it, it's it's like, propagandizing nothing. That's the thing. It's right. like propaganda without content. 
Like yes. the, the, this is the yeah. same project that's so uh, uh, fixated on aesthetic right. trappings. It's like forgotten that the symbols were ever attached to anything to begin right. with. Right. So let's here we'll do a. Th this is actually a method in the lyrics. Um, the lyrics carefully avoid being about anything. So here's one. I'm brain, bone, and fist. So put me on your list. The enemy to you is not what it is to me. Right? What the fuck does that mean? The first of these statements is like, whoa, all right, he's getting pretty out there, right? He's talking to the feds. Um, that's like actually a fine lyric on its own, right? It's kind of like, it's, it's propagandistic. It's kind of like rock and punk, punk lyric. It's like an RAC lyric or something, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, not, it's not a black metal lyric, but it's, it's fine for what it is. Then you go to the next one. The enemy to you is not what it is to me. Immediate evasion, right? Mm -hmm. You could say, I am your enemy, right? Put me on your list. I'm your enemy. Uh, you know, um, you are my enemy. I will destroy you, right? Here are a bunch of black metal sentiments. Instead, we get, the enemy to you is not what it is to me. It's this elaborate web of double negations, um, and, it inst and this is what I call the Flaming Ouroboros patented faint and retreat method, right? You, uh, you, you, put, you like put yourself out there way more than you need to, and then you draw back, right? Black metal is art, right? It works by abstraction and imagination. It, you don't have to write topical political lyrics, right? And especially not when they could get you fired or arrested. But what's in, what's this guy's interested in is the lyrics that you get you fired or arrested. Yeah, <laughs> and he's constantly signaling that, and he never delivers. Um, and uh, um, and and as so everything you know, they have a track called "Kick 'Em Out," which uh, you know suggests obviously that suggests the concept of um assisted repatriation. <laughs> right, uh, but if you read the lyrics, they're just completely meaningless. Um, I step on your flag. What a pity it must be to own the humble abode you call free. What? Who's he the talking to? What the fuck does that to? mean? Is he talking to Americans? I, I, is he talking to non-Americans? I don't understand. As brothers unite under one, we fall. What does that mean? When time comes to fight, we must stand tall. For what it's worth, keep your mouth closed. When the time is near, I represent the birth to kick them out, kick them out. The dawn of blood. That sounds pretty edgy, but no worries. Take your time. We have all day, all night to rebuild what is lost. So what do we do? Kick them out, kick them out. It's carefully, especially with that first stanza about I step on your flag. What a pity it must be to own the humble abode you call free. Oh, yeah. Right? It's, it's a it's, Rorschach it's, test for your ideology so anyone it, it gives you can read into it yeah complete plausible deniability because it could just as easily it could be about you know what is it, it could be the classic uh, i spit on the red flag or it could be um you know what it really sounds like is like fuck your american flag man i'm burning it on the fourth of july man you know um it's uh and it yeah complete plausible deniability uh and it's uh you know, this is fucking terrible.
And we are back from um, uh, sort of uh, steamrolling the last record to review Iconoclast by White Death out on Werewolf Records. So, in a way, what we've got today is sort of the beginning, and we've done it in reverse order. We've started with the end of the modern sort of tendency towards hyper-melodic black metal, and now we're going back to the beginning. Um, and, you know, we talked about how, you know, a lot of this this sort of, this elaborate game of telephone started with everyone getting really into Finnish black metal in the, uh, probably the mid 20 teens um for some people of course for the people who are really on the cusp of course earlier than that other people a little later um uh you know um it started with excellent finnish black metal it ended with fucking flaming ouroboros um but white death is a finnish black metal band who really helped um who were there at the sort of the turn of the tide for all this um so, history, right? Let the Devil In in 2010 was really the last of the major Finn Black records, right? By the classic four bands, right? Mm-hmm. Your, your, your Sargeist, your Horna, your Satanic War Master, and Goat Moon. Um, and by, by that time, they'd all made their definitive statements. You had Sano Yesirele a year or two before then. And they all kind of went dormant. That doesn't mean necessarily not releasing things. Just the things they released were less interesting. Um, and... It, in that time, their influence kind of percolated through the underground, right? And it was one of the things that led people, that and the interest in LLN led people back to Senor Volan, to Crystal Knocked, all that. Um, uh, and uh, it wasn't really till around 2017 uh, when shit really came to a head with two big simultaneous releases from uh, Werewolf Records. Um, so that is Satanic War Master Werewolf's label. Werewolf spelled with Werewolf spelled with an E, as opposed to his own moniker, which is spelled without the second E. Um, and so he released the first White Death self-titled record, um, along with Goat Moon's Stella Polaris, uh, and both of them with really big, beefy productions that signaled that they were making a bid for the main line of black metal. Right, basically challenging the worn out, uh, you know, the worn out, exhausted Orthodox BM that was still big at that time, um, and uh, and and from that moment, really, Finn Black started to become, and the the Franco Finnish style more broadly started to become the really the common language of the underground. Right, mm-hmm. people realized, oh wait, <laughs> you know, two to three, co- you know, sliding two to three string chords with this kind of, um, uh, with this kind of stern minor key melody is uh, really the way to go. <laughs> for, like, like Shout for, for composing a certain specifically like Shoutrog's guitar style and Werewolf's guitar style became the like lingua franca of like a large, large fraction of black metal. For sure, for sure. Um, and uh, and so these two records come out. Um, I listened to both of them a decent amount, but of the two, the White Death record was way better. Um, Stella Polaris is, I mean, you, you've said it kind of sucks, right? Yeah, I don't like that it's, one. It's, it's like, it's got kind of a satisfying, beefy production, but like it's, it really is almost just like, it, it was like Black Goat sort of stepping away from the Goat Moon sound to write just a bad version of a Norwegian 90s record. Um, mm. The uh, White Death um, was also sounded a little more 90s than you would expect, um, but it sounded more like Gorgoroth, which really was a core influence for the Finns in the first place. Um, and because it had that glossier production and more like the standard... Um, less overtly punky, more of the standard sort of satanic and evil vibe that people expected from black metal at that time. It did quite well, um, and it appealed to people who might not have been, say, deeply invested in when the next Witzhaus record was coming out, Mm -hmm. Um, right? Or may never have heard of, you know, Seelan Vahonen. And, however, what... uh, what really made White Death in a lot of ways was um, uh, was, was the final track, uh, 
the uh, White Death's Power, um, which, uh, you know, trollishly named. And this was kind of a folky goat moon banger uh, that had pretty timely anti-Islamic lyrics and obviously a title designed to really wind people up. Um, and if you just take that track, I think it's really what people glommed onto. Nowadays, the, the sort of nowadays stompy black metal influenced by Finnish stuff and absurd and whatever, it all fucking sounds like that. Mm-hmm. All fucking sounds like that. Um, so they were kind of there, and there are bits of that sort of intense Finnish melody on the other tracks, but it's really there. Um, and it's a song that's both very catchy, shout along with your boys, and really kind of nasty mm-hmm. in the way that, say, like Old Impaled Nazarene is or whatever. Um, it, it, it is, um, it doesn't have the, uh, accidental pop music effect we were just talking about with the previous band. Yeah. Um, so, so they were kind of this, this formative thing. And of course, you know, uh, the band, the track title, the band name, all of this is designed to wind people up. Um, the, uh, after, and there, that trollish aspect of the band has, has always been sort of important to it. Um. After this album, White Death really basically just disappeared. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a promo record that came out in 2020, and then just nothing else. Uh, and word on the street was that the frontman, Vritron, maybe wasn't that into it anymore, but maybe he's changed his mind. I, I don't know. Either way, these tracks have finally seen the light, and we've got another White Death record. Um mm-hmm. So yeah, that that's the history. Uh, what do you make of it? So I, I don't know. While you were talking about it, it, occurred to me. So the title of this record is Iconoclast. But it, like, and I an Iconoclast to what exactly yeah. in this case? Because it, it seems to me that this is not very iconoclastic, and in fact, it's like very reverent of Finnish black metal in particular. And I've got mixed feelings about that, specifically. Um, <clears throat> so, this isn't a bad record. It's pretty fun and, you know, listenable all the way through. Definitely not going to make a year-end list for me, but it's it's solid. That being said, all the good points about it are really just the good points of Finnish black metal in general. All the things that White Death executes well on this record are just the fundamental aspects of Finnish black metal that have made it such a a, a dominant cultural force within black metal over the past 10 years. That doesn't make any of those things worse, but it definitely gives White Death less of an individual identity. Now, to their credit, uh, this is a band that sees... Finnish black metal and its legacy as something beyond just Sargeist, Horna, the usual suspects. You know, they go further back into the roots of the genre's national identity. But ultimately, this is a record that's just sort of celebrating itself at a certain point. And I don't know, this this seems to be part of... uh, you know, I, I think that ever since we started this show back in 2020, we were at the, you know, we began it, we began it as we were burning out on Finnish black metal. Now, it, it never completely goes away because we both like that style, but we've just heard so many of those records for so many years. Um, it's, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it's like, this is a record that is about celebrating its own scene, which is fine, but Finnish black metal has sort of just been doing that for a decade now. You know, it feels like ev- almost every black metal record that comes out of Finland is just a victory lap. And it's like, yeah, man, we understand you guys won the great black metal conflict and your style is now the center of the genre, more or less. But like, I mean, it's been 14 years since Let the Devil In. And there hasn't been anything as significant as that since. Like, are, are we just going to make Finnish black metal this legacy style where we keep reproducing these symbols, or are we going to try something new? That's the thing that you've said before, which is that this 
just celebrating herself is not the thing that made Finnish black metal the the dominant genre today, right? They yeah. in, invented something. They distilled a certain energy. They synthesized the, you know, the Norwegian stuff with the Slavic and German heathen stuff. They, you know, there was a... Um, there was a distillation of something essential about black metal that allowed people who weren't as good at guitar as Gorgoroth or Dawn to play riffs that sounded like that. Yeah. Right? That's like a huge thing. Um, and uh, they did all that while retaining the punk roots and stuff, right? So there was Finnish black metal, and they've they've had the most... Finland has by far the most longevity of any of the classic black metal scenes. Mm-hmm. But yeah. when... Um, with shit like this, it's sort of, uh, um, it's not the energy that made you the king, right? Um, and the, you know, um, what were you saying? Like celebrating itself, um, the victory lap thing is right, right? We got, we already got the ultimate Finnish black metal victory lap, which was the return of Satanic War Master last yeah. year, right? That record is just fantastic, and it's and it's good in part because it's more than a victory lap. It shows everything uh, Werewolf learned about composition in his time away, um, and uh, and adds adds a lot of unexpected, interesting stuff to the songs, and very deliberately resists the um, a lot of the things that have become cliche about the style, especially the sort of uh, sugar coated riffs. Yeah. Um, and so, so we've already got that. Uh, and maybe now that that victory lap has happened, she should be moving forward more. So on the White Death record, it should be noted, Werewolf plays on this. Mm-hmm. I think maybe what happened is that while Satanic Warmaster, you know, he did uh, Fimble Venture, which was a little more sort of symphonic and exploratory. Good record, just like away from his regular sound. He did that, and then not long after that, he did the first White Death record, he did this. I think it became an outlet for his sort of more primitive impulses. Um, And I don't know how much he's writing on this. You know, we reviewed that Grieve record where he really only wrote, like, a bit. Um, But uh, he does play on this record. Um, And so here, Vritron, Werewolf, and the other guys, right, uh, they do have, you know, the Finnish guys are you know, committed and smart. They know where they stand in the tradition. So they know they don't want to pander, right? So to that end, you know, like the Satanic Warmaster record, this does sort of resist what people want from it. I think that might have been what he was going for with the Iconoclast title. They yeah. deliberately recorded it way raw. The songs are extremely, extremely minimalist to the point of being deliberately boring at times in a way that is consistent with the trollish spirit of the band. Yeah, um, I I, I, I want to get back to that in a yes, second. <laughs> yes, and they are reaching, yeah, as you already said, reaching further back. Um, you could hear how this is very closely connected to Impaled Nazarene from the 90s, say, or whatever. But, like, um, it's, uh, they do all that, but in the end, it is still a victory lap record. And, you know, other scenes run into this problem, right? It's like NYHC, right? Mm. Never forget the Lower East Side crew. It's like, bro, I can't. You won't, <laughs> you won't let me. Right? Or, you know, or it's like, I'm sure this is a problem with some hip hop scenes, right? It's just like, there's a bit too much representing. Yeah. Well, I, right? That, you, well, you want one track on every record. You're absolutely entitled to have one track on every record where you're like, this is Finnish black metal. Represent. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't need to be the whole record. Well, that, that sort of relates to the trollishness where it's like, and, and I don't know, maybe this is kind of a broader thing that I have about, like, trollishness trollishness in black metal in general. Which is, like, mm-hmm. who exactly is getting trolled? Mm-hmm. Because it's, like, so so we've arrived at a point where it's, like, this isn't, you know, 1993 anymore. No one is bothered by black metal. I mean, yeah, obviously some some people get bothered by political stuff and everything, but that's not that's not really inherent to black metal. That's not something special to the genre. That's just you know using uh, sort of standard techniques to upset people. Um, so black metal isn't really you know as it is threatening to normies, so to speak. So you can't really be trolling them. 
So the only in, in people, a way, the political discourse has caught up to black metal in 1993. Yeah. So really, the only people you can be trolling at a certain point is like your own audience. And I'm not necessarily, <laughs> yes. I'm not necessarily against that. I think there's something to like trolling metalheads, but it seems very weird for a band like this, which is like so caught up in its sort of like mystical hero worship of itself to be doing that. I, like, like, do you do you get what I'm like thrusting at here? It, it's it's like, what what point is being made? Like, well, because, if you're like, saying if you're, you're telling the listener, so we should we should sample the bad song. Oh, oh, my first sample. I think that would be a good example for. People okay, yeah, because let's let's. This jump is into this that. is some musical trolling. Let me. I'll say like, there's a track. The record starts with a kind of boilerplate song. Yeah. And then two really long, slow, deliberately boring tracks. There's something funny and cool about this. On repeat listen, I kind of like Iconoclast because it commits to the bit. But there's two of them back to back for almost 12 minutes. Um, these two together make the whole album as a whole, which is only 48 minutes, feel like it's an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, and they make it really feel like it only starts with really gets off the ground with track four so there's something weird going on here there is some trolling the listener and then we get to track three which is what you want to sample yeah Al Apam Lee Amnuk um, we're going to listen to a couple minutes of this from the beginning because there's a, a couple points that I want to make and yeah it's kind of funny if it's intentional but I'm also not so sure <laughs> Okay, so I've got I've got a couple major points to make about this song, but th that also kind of apply to the record as a whole. Uh, the first one is um, Horna still exists. Like there's still a band that's out there releasing material. Uh, so I'm not really sure why this song is strictly necessary. I understand you guys are from Finland. I understand that you can imitate the Horna sound which might have been unusual in the late 2000s to be able to pull that off, but I am in a band right now that trades heavily in Horna-isms. This is not a secret technique anymore. So I understand that you're celebrating the scene, but at this point, it, it it's not even distinctly Finnish anymore. It's been done so much. Um, 
The second point that I want to make is that at a minute and a half into this track, they play the uh, a riff with exactly the same chording as the main riff to Green Day's When I Come Around. I understand that it is a common punk chord structure, but it is critical that you understand that it is the riff from When I Come Around. <laughs> There's a lot of punk chord structures they could have chosen for that moment. Did they have to choose an immediately recognizable one from rock radio? Yes. It could have been any. It doesn't fucking matter what goes there because they don't really give a shit about the song. And, like, look, I'm sure that progression is somewhere on an Ultima Thule record, but it doesn't matter. It's the when I come around for it. Like, like, we, we don't need to, like, play... We don't need to play ignorant about the context all this happens in. Um, You know, like, I mean, there's like, you know, sure, maybe you don't specifically know when I come around, but you talk, everyone knows, especially if you play it sort of completely as an unadorned, just eighth note or quarter note chord progression like that. Yeah. You know, it's an indulgent pop punk riff, right? Yeah. It's just, it's... And that kind of gets to the trollishness. It's like between that and the, the, the fucking offspring song from the end of the last Goat Moon record, it's like, is there something going around in Finland? Like all the guys are just like, hey, dude, w- watch what we're going to put in here and just see if if people like even realize it. Yeah, you know, you know, in which case it's working because Flaming Ouroboros is the consequence, right? The Finns are like, LOL, man, let's fucking throw that pop punk riff in there. These suckers eat it up. And hey, lo and behold, the Americans do, and then they imitate it. Hey, check it out. I, I, I just put a trim version of Eiffel 65's Blue in this song. Let's see if they let's see if they realize it's not black metal. That's been a that's a thing that's fucking me up. As we've talked about on the show, guys that are like people writing reviews of Roster Chester and talking about how cold and grim it is. They don't even have the fucking language to describe anything Ma- anymore. Mas yeah. Brutal. Yeah, Mas, Mas fucking Brutal. You know, it, like, yeah, Eisenwinter is like heavy and raw as fuck when it sounds like Tiger Trap. So, but yeah, this is like a thing across the record, which is like one being deliberately reductive, which, okay, raw black metal, I understand that, but it's like, it's not really an interesting take on it. It's just sort of like, yeah, you can, in fact, repeat these sort of conventionalized structures that we all understand, but you're doing it within the guise of being a celebration of sort of Finnish black metal, but at this point, these aren't even, like, really Finnish black metal ideas anymore. They're just black metal ideas. They've been democratized for the whole world to use. So, I don't know. I just, I find it very weird. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there's, the question here is like, I understand what's being done, right? You make the listener wait 10 minutes. You, you, this guy, this guy's very aware that Finnish black metal has become, has been abused as the sort of lingua franca for pop black metal right and he doesn't want to do that and so the funny thing is we're going to drag you through two mid-tempo horn stompers and then 12 minutes into the record we'll give you what you want right here you want it bitch don't you here it fucking is here it is it's the fucking green day riff um and uh like that is funny but to a degree like when the joke's on the listener it's also on you Right. You could have made the, the song better. Um, and like it's. Uh, yeah, like there's something to the barrier to entry track. Right. You know, the, the first track on Gorgoroth's Under the Sign of Hell or whatever. Mm. But um, but this is, you know, it's a weird thing to do in the middle of the barrier to entry track. Yeah. You do this kind of like like nudge wink fan service and then you go back. Um, it's. uh it's not great, and these two songs back to back really sort of uh, fuck with the pacing of the record. Yeah, yeah, they do. So, where things really get off the ground is, and give me something like what this record advertises itself as, is uh, "Strife for Blood," uh, track four. Um, here you can there's a uh, cool connection to early Emperor, and you can really hear the Finnish black grind aesthetic.
almost like to hear this as sort of more of a hip hop style presentation where you get that sort of in the shadow of the horns thing. If someone <laughs> just before that that final bridge where he faded out, if someone just shouted like, yo, satanic war master on the mic, represent werewolf. <laughs> werewolf. You know? Play me some of that gangsta ass Finland yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Werewolf. What? Um, that's clearly just a werewolf riff in the middle, right? Yeah. That, that could have been on the last but Satanic I, War Master I record. really like that sort of like like thrashing black and roll riff right before it, too. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. This is a great song. This is... It doesn't really... Yeah, there's... Uh, it yeah, it this, is just... Th- this block of like this and the next couple tracks is the strongest material on the record. Yeah, if there was a full record, and in fact, we sampled that whole block, right? I also got the next one, Life and Death, You Got to Die a Thousand yep. Times. If if you did a whole record like that and everything was kind of deliberately samey and just blistering high speed finished black metal, I honestly would like that better. Um, yeah, there's some cool stuff here. So first, that first riff... Um, it's cool because um, yeah, it's like all a Marduk those riff. sort of interval. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot like a Marduk riff. All of those intervals are very familiar from Marduk or for the early emperor or whatever. But it's kind of cool because it could just be one of those. Instead, there's like three phrases there. And I feel like it's kind of like a black metal version of what you call the mortician. You know how, like, mortician or brutal death, they'll just sort of, like, slide around on chromatics? Yeah, yeah. Right? So this is, like, it has a little more shape to it than that, but these are just some, like, classic angular Norse black metal intervals. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yo, just slide on that a bit, right? And it sounds nasty, and it gives it that grinding energy that you would get on... um, either Marduk or Impaled Nazarene, uh, and it even evokes the more sort of Beharit Archgoat stuff, mm-hmm. especially because of the vocals. Uh, I love the high-low approach here. Um, I wish that was on the rest of the record. I think that's a funny way of trolling the fans, is having death growls. Uh, yeah. A lot of people just, a lot of people who are into this, you know, the most melodic side of black metal really pussy out at any of the more burly heavy metal gestures in the music. Mm-hmm. Um And if you just throw in some death growls and just some nasty death growls, that's cool. And it's like the pitch shifted gurgle moment in Wrath of the Tyrant, you know. Yeah, but that's also. But that's you see, that's a case where being referential to Finnish black metal is like pretty cool because that's an especially Finnish thing. Like Mm -hmm. early Impaled Nazarene, like those first couple records have a lot of like weird pitch shifted vocals on them. Uh, Beharit, obviously. Archgoat has never gotten rid of their death metal influence. So that's an essential part of Finnish black metal that is more forgotten than a a lot of other stuff. So when White Death reaches toward that sort of thing, you know, the, the deeper cut stuff from early Finnish black metal, the idea of this being a sort of referential, you know, history tour of the style makes more sense. Oh, the other one that everyone forgets, early Behexen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which used to be mentioned in the same breath as the other, as the big four. Um, but like, uh, Behexen has the kind of, um, it has the stern, noble sliding chord riffs, but it really also has just a heavy immediate death metal influence and death growls and yeah, shit. Yeah, Behexen is Marduk Sargeist. Yeah, yeah, you got that sort of, um, so the, that riff that comes after it, you've got this really soaring riff that's just two notes. That's like an impaled Nazarene thing or a Behexen thing or something, right? You get that sort of, um, you get the satisfying consonant punch of the Finnish style, but super minimalist. And then you get the stomp, which is also very Behexen, or mm-hmm. as you say, arch goat or something like that. And then that sick just... Just when you think it's going to be all this minimalist stuff, it's like, yeah, hell yeah, it's werewolf. Yeah. Right? It's uh, like, that's awesome, right? This is Strife for Blood is a sick party anthem. Like, I would, it, it, I will put this on at a party. Right? Yeah. No, it's, is... a, that's very good. I, I, but that, like, that just sort of, like, brings the question up again. It's like, hey, why couldn't you have just done, like, a whole good album? Yeah. You know? <laughs> So let's get to the next one. All right. So we're now on um, Life in Death. This is the next one. Uh, And here we're going to lead with the big werewolf riff. Um, And then, or with the big sort of Corellian Satanist madness type riff. And then getting the stuff that's a lot closer to strength and honor. Um,
right. So that is sick too. Mm-hmm. There you lead, you lead off with this kind of agile, pointillistic arpeggio riff. And then just you get just big, four huge, nasty block chords that sound, they have some of the stern Dorian feel, but it's a lot more tense, right? Mm-hmm. That's very much like the, the some of the riffs on Strength and Honor, especially the title track. Um, and you alternate between those, and then they throw in another, sort of like dip a step or something, and you get a lower storming riff uh, in the middle, just the, the last full riff we had. Um, really cool, and... This is more, like, really this sequence you could just have heard on Amon Gondor. If you cleaned it up and added a denser arrangement. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like some of my favorite tracks for that. Uh, the Eye of Satan and Darkness Triumphator. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, very cool. Um, really not much to say about it aside from that. I just, I like the riff. Yeah, I, I, I like the riff too. Um well, let me get to the what I think is the best track on the album, which is interesting given this record's whole conceit. Um, this is... I want to play the back half of To Die a Thousand Times. Um, this is, I think, like... So, like, the last, the last 500 times? Yeah. I mean, they're all pretty similar. Um, mm-hmm. This is the best track on this record that is supposed to be a, a huge worship session for Finnish black metal and it's the best one because it sounds like Swedish black death instead. I really love that song. And while undoubtedly, just because it's 2024 and everyone's doing everything everywhere, I'm sure there's Finnish bands trading in this sort of thing now. That is traditionally all the way a a Swedish Black Death sort of arrangement. Um, that that's like directly emerging from like dissection and sacramentum, etc. And I think it's awesome. Uh, and I think it's hilarious that far and away my favorite song is the one that sounds the least finished on the record. Some, some like canter, some of the more deep cut stuff that goes sort of towards the mellow death end of the spectrum too, like Cantorous Quintet or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, it's definitely like far yeah. moving toward the Gothenburg direction or, there. Yeah, necrophobic. The the sort of the spooky arpeggios at the beginning you can hear it being like dark side necrophobic or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um. It does sound... So this whole past sequence sounds very Swedish, I agree. I think you would like the first black, the first White Death record then, because 
a lot of that, it sounds more like Gorgoth and more like this kind of Swedish oh, stuff. I, I heard it. I don't remember oh, yeah. it super distinctly, but I do remember liking it. Back yeah, then. it's just kind of like banger stuff like this where it's a little more towards the... You have a little more of that kind of arpeggiated lead work than you usually hear in the Swe- in the Finnish mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and uh, the... Um, although here it's more pyrotechnic and epic. Uh, the... Um, the beginning of this track I really like too because it just has sort of like ripping thrash beats um, yeah. and kind of more of that spindly lead guitar which is done really well here um, and it made me think of something that I, I'm surprised you didn't mention which is Cradle of Filth um, yeah the, I mean the, it, it definitely is very Cradle of Filth and we've, we've noticed over the past couple years a lot of Finnish stuff sort of like pulling back in the direction of like Cradle of Filth or even Dimmu Borger here and there yeah, no, Seelan Volan and, and um, uh, White Rune uh, both do have done that. Mateus mm-hmm. has talked about just unironically liking Cradle of Filth. Yeah. Um, and so you hear some of that here, too. And the song sort of goes from a more... Also, Hecate Enthroned, I would say. This is the more upbeat, thrashing sort of side of those, those bands. And then it gets more Swedish. But yeah, this is cool because you hear them reaching a little bit s- laterally. Um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, now. This being said, this block of tracks we've just played. Here's this is sort of the downfall. Is I don't think the last third of this record is very good either. I, I think it's better than like the opening third, but all the momentum of this record for me is concentrated around these middle tracks, and then it just sort of decays in the last few and doesn't leave a very strong impression. So at its height, some of these songs are really great. I just wish that it's so clear that the best songs on this record are the highest effort ones. And I Mm -hmm. don't understand the like deliberately low effort nature of a lot of the rest of it. I think that's totally fair. Yeah. I think the last, when I tried to find Sam, I remember liking the last three or at least the last, the last one was forgettable, but the the two before that, um, I remember liking them. But then when I tried to check them for samples, I was like, Oh wait, it's, it's just all this stuff in the middle. Um, you know, um, I appreciate that they have a track called Concerto of Sodomy. Um, you got to keep the pervy stuff in black metal. That's an important part Crucial. of it. Crucial, yeah. Crucial, you know. It, there's way too much of that. The the turn toward the solar BM thing, unfortunately, means a lot of it is now squeaky clean. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Finns on the werewolf scene in particular do a good job of keeping the, uh, the greasier candles burning. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but yeah, I, the last three tracks are completely forgettable. So what this really is, is a very strong EP. If yes. this had been released as an EP, I think it would feel... Um, if it had been released with a little less fanfare, I think it would have had... And as an EP, I think it would have had a big, big impact. And it would have been one of those things, like a really good hardcore EP, where I can just listen to it on loop. Yeah. Um, and the as thing... it is... Oh, go ahead. Well, as it is, there's some great material that has been padded out with stuff that seems almost deliberately low effort. Yeah, and I I think that you get at something with the whole fanfare thing, which is Mm -hmm. that, like, okay, I I understand that part of the benefit of being a longtime musician in a scene with a successful label is getting to put out whatever you want and, you know, being able to sustain bigger than anticipated releases for, you know, you and your friends fucking around, basically. Which which is essentially what has happened here. Like, but I guess what I'm saying is, like, so much of this record sounds like it was just, like, having some beers in the jam room. But, you know, the guys in the jam room in this case are, like, relatively accomplished and well-known Finnish black metal musicians. And I think that I would... My feelings toward this would be more generous if this was, you know, a couple hundred copies on cassette and not, like, a full media push. You know what I mean? Because this is this is clearly deliberately kind of low effort. Clearly, a lot of this material was written in a very short period of time. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it does rub me the wrong way when you're 
essentially leveraging the notoriety of the people involved to allow something that is clearly not 100% serious the status of much more significant works. I, I mean, I guess I might be nitpicking, and that's just kind of how things work. And I don't really begrudge Werewolf for doing it. I'd probably do it in the same situation. But, you know, just as a listener, it's like, if you want to do your kind of trolley side project thing, that's fine. But, like, does that need a vinyl release, really? 